How to Read and Why by Harold Bloom Chapter 1 Short Stories Introduction The Irish writer Frank O'Connor celebrated the short story in his lonely voice, believing that it dealt best with isolated individuals, particularly those upon society's fringes. If this were wholly true, the short story would have developed almost into the opposite of one of its likeliest origins, the folktale. Then the short story, unlike the lyrical poem, would wound once and once only, and also, unlike novels, which can afflict us with many sensations, with multiple sorrows and joys. But so indeed can the stories of Chekhov and his few peers. Short stories are not parables or wise sayings, and so cannot be fragments. We ask them for the pleasures of closure. Kafka's magnificent fragment, The Hunter, Gracchus, ends when the undead hunter, a kind of wandering Jew or ancient mariner, is asked by a sea town's mayor how long he intends to prolong his visit. I cannot tell, Burgomiser. Gretchen replies, My ship has no rudder and is driven by a wind that rises from the icy regions of death. That is not closure, but what could Kafka have added? Gretchen's final sentence is more memorable than all but a few deliberate endings of stories. How does one read a short story? Edgar Allan Poe would have said, At one sitting, Poe stories, despite their permanent worldwide popularity, are atrociously written, as are his poems, and benefits by translation, even into English. But Poe is hardly one of the authentic ancestors of the modern short stories. These include Pushkin and Balzac, Gogol and Turgenev, Maupassant and Chekhov and Henry James. The modern masters of the form are James Joyce and D. H. Lawrence, Isaac Babel and Ernest Hemingway, and a varied group including Borges, Nabokov, Thomas Mann, Eudora Welty, Flannery O'Connor, Tommaso Landolfi, and Tello Calvino. I will center here upon stories by Chekhov and by Chekhov, by Maupassant and by Hemingway by Flannery O'Connor and by Vladimir Nabokov, Jorge Luis Borges, Tommaso Landolfi, and by Italo Calvino, because all of them achieve something like perfection in their art. Ivan Turgenev Frank O'Connor sets Turgenev's sketches from a hunter's album 1852, over any other single volume of short stories. A century and a half after its composition, Sketches remains astonishingly fresh, though its topicality, the need to emaciate the serfs, has yielded to all the disasters of Russian history. Turgenev's stories are uncannily beautiful. Taken together, they are as magnificent an answer to the question, why read, as I know, always accepting Shakespeare. Turgenev, who loved Shakespeare and Cervantes, divided up all mankind, of the questing sort, either into Hamlets or Don Quixotes. He might have added Falstaffs or Sancho Panzas, since with Hamlet and the Don, they form a fourfold paradigm for so many other fictive beings. It is difficult to single out particular stories from the 25 in sketches, but I joined several other critics in a special fondness for Beshin Lea, or Metal, and Cassian from the Beautiful Lands. Beshin Lea begins on a beautiful July morning, with Turgenev out grusu shooting. The hunter loses his way and comes at night to a meadowland where a group of five peasant boys sit around two fires. Joining them, Turgenev introduces us to them. 
they range in age from 7 to 14, and all of them believe in goblins, the little people who share their world. Turgenev's art wisely allows the boys to talk to one another, while he listens and does not intrude. Their life of hard work, they and their parents are serfs. Superstition, village legend, is revealed to us, complete with Trishka, the Antichrist to come, enticing mermaids who catch souls, the walking dead, and those marked to die. One boy, Pavlusha, stands out from the rest as the most intelligent and likable. He demonstrates his courage when he rushes forth barehanded to drive away what could be wolves, who threaten the grazing horses that the boys guard in the night. After some hours, Turgenev falls asleep, to wake up just before dawn. The boys sleep on, though Pavlusha raises himself up for a last intense glance at the hunter. Turgenev starts home, describing the beautiful morning, and then ends the sketch by adding that, later that year, Pavlusha died in a fall from a horse. We feel the pity of the lost, with Turgenev, who remarks that Pavlusha was a fine boy, but the pathos of the death is not rendered as such. A continuum engages us, the beauty of the meadow and of the dawn, the vividness of the boy's preternatural beliefs, the fate not to be evaded that takes away Pavlusha, and the rest that is a pragmatic, yet somehow still quixotic Turgenev. Shooting his gross and sketching the boys in the landscape in his album. Why read Bess and Leia? At the least, to know better our own reality, our vulnerability to fate, while learning also to appreciate aesthetically Turgenev's tact and only apparent detachment as a storyteller. If there is any irony in this sketch, it belongs to fate itself, a fate just about as innocent as the landscape, the boys, the hunter. Turgenev is one of the most Shakespearean of writers in that he too refrains from moral judgments. He also knows that a favorite, like Pavlusha, will vanish by a sudden accident. There is no single interpretive point to carry away from the Bezlehin meadow. The narrative voice is not to be distinguished from Turgenev's own self, which is wisely passive, loving, meticulously observant. That self, like Pavlusha's, is part of the story's value. Something in most of us is where it wants to be, with the boys, the horses, the compassionate hunter-writer, the talk of goblins and river tempresses, in perfect weather, in Bess and Leia. To achieve Turgenev's apparent simplicity as a writer of sketches, you need the highest gifts, something very like Shakespeare's genius for rediscovering the human. Turgenev too shows us something that perhaps is always there, that we cannot see without him. Dostoevsky learned from Shakespeare how to create the supreme nihilists Svidrigailov and Stavrogin by observing Aigo, satanic majesty of non-nihilists. Turgenev, like Henry James, learns something subtler from Shakespeare. The mystery of the seemingly commonplace, the rendering of a reality that is perpetually augmenting. Directly after Bez Hinlea comes Cassian from the Beautiful Lands, where Turgenev gives us a fully miraculous character, the dwarf Cassian, a mystical serf and faith healer, perhaps a sect of one. Returning from a hunting trip, the author's horse-drawn cart suffers a broken axle. In a nearby town that is no town, Turgenev and his surly driver encounter a dwarf of about fifty years old, with a small, swarty, wrinkled face, a little painted nose, 
barely discernible little brown eyes and abundant curly black hair which sat upon his tiny head just as brawly as a cap sits on the stalk of a mushroom. His entire body was extraordinarily frail and thin. We are constantly reminded how uncanny, how unexpected Cassian truly is. Though his voice invariably is gentle and sweet, he severely condemns hunting as ungodly, and he maintains throughout a strong dignity, as well as a sorrow of an exile, resettled by the authorities and so deprived of the beautiful lands of the Dawn region. Everything about little Cassian is paradoxical. Turgenev's driver explains that a dwarf is a holy man known as the Flea. Hunter and Healer go off together for a walk in the woods while the axle is being mended. Gathering herbs, jumping as he goes, mothering to himself, Cassian speaks to the birds in their own language, but says not a word to Turgenev. Driven by the heat to find shelter together in the bushes, Hunter and Holy Dwarf enjoy their silence reveries until Cassian demands justification for the shooting of birds. When Turgenev asks the dwarf's occupation, Cassian replies that he catches nightingales to give them away to others, that he is literate, and admits his healing powers. And though he says he has no family, his secret is revealed when his small, teenage natural daughter, Anushka, suddenly appears in the woods. The child is beautiful and shy, and has been out gathering mushrooms. Though Cassian denies his parentage, Neither we nor Turgenev are persuaded, and after the child departs, Cassian scarcely speaks for the remainder of the story. We are left with enigmas, as his driver can scarcely enlighten Turgenev while they depart. To him, Cassian is nothing but contradictions. Untellable. Nothing more is told, and Turgenev returns home. His thoughts on Cassian remain unexpressed, but do we need them? The pleasant hunter lives in his own world, not the Russia of the serfs, but a Russian version of the biblical world. Albeit totally unlike the rival biblical versions of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Cassian, though he shies away from rebellion, has rejected Russian society and returned to the arts and ways of the folk. He would not let his daughter abide a moment in the presence of the benign Turgenev, who admires the child's beauty. One need not idealize Cassian. His peasant shrewdness and perceptions exclude a great deal of value, but he, he incarnates truths of folklore that he himself may scarcely know that he knows. The dominant atmosphere of Turgenev's sketches is the beauty of the landscape when experienced in ideal weather. Yet there is a large difference between the natural beauty shared by Turgenev and the peasant boys in Beshen Lea, and the something less than communion between Cassian and Turgenev where they shade themselves in the forest. Pavlushka's fates cannot be resisted, only accepted. But Kazyan is, in his own subtle way, as much a magical master of reality as Shakespeare's Prospero was. Kazyan's magical natural world is not akin to Turgenev's aesthetically apprehended nature, even when holy man and hunter rider rest side by side. Nor will Kazyan admit Turgenev into his secret, or even a momentary exchange with his beautiful elf of a daughter. Finally, we come to see that Kazian is still from the beautiful lands, even though he has lost his original home near the dawn. The beautiful lands belong to closed folk tradition, of which Kazian is a kind of shaman. We read, Kazian from the beautiful lands to attain a version of otherness, close to all but a few of us, and close to Turgenev as well. The reward for reading Katzen's story is that we are admitted, 
very briefly into an alternate reality, where Chagda himself entered only briefly, and yet sublimely brought back in his sketches. Anton Chekhov It is a long journey from Turgenev's stories to Chekhov's and Hemingway's, even though the Nick Adams stories could have been called sketches from a fisherman's album. Still, Turgenev, Chekhov, and Hemingway share a quality that looks like detachment and turns out to be something else. Their affinity with their landscape and human figures is central in Turgenev, Chekhov, and Hemingway. This is very different from the sense of immersion in social worlds and in geysers of characters in Balzac and in Dickens. The genius of both novelists was lavish at people in Paris and London with entire show social classes as well as grotesquely impressive individuals. Balzac, unlike Dickens, excelled also at the short stories and built many of them into his human comedy. Yet they lack the resonances of Balzac's novels and cannot compare to the stories of Turgenev and Chekhov, Maupassant and Hemingway. Even Chekhov's earliest stories can have the formal delicacy and somber reflectiveness that make him the indispensable artist of the unlived life and the major influence upon all story writers after him. I say all because Chekhov's former innovations as a storyteller though profuse, are less consequential than his Shakespearean inwardness, his carrying over into the stories, longer or shorter, the major newness in Shakespeare's characterizations, a foregrounding that I discuss elsewhere in this book in regard to Hamlet. In a sense, Chekhov was more Shakespearean even than Turgenev, who in his novels took care to background the earlier lives of his protagonists. One should write, Chekhov said, so that the reader needs no explanations from the author. The actions, conversations, and meditations of the characters had to be sufficient. A practice followed also in Chekhov's finest plays, Three Sisters, and The Cherry Orchard. My favorite early Chekhov story is The Kiss, written when he was 27. Ryabovich, the shyest, drabbest, and most retiring officer in the artillery brigade, accompanies his fellow officers to an evening social at the country manor of a retired general. Wandering about the house, the boar Ryabovich enters a dark room and experiences an adventure. Mistaking him for someone else, a woman kisses him and recoils. He rushes away and henceforth is obsessed with the encounter, which initially brings exultation, but then becomes a torment. The wretched fellow is in love, albeit with a woman totally unknown and never to be encountered again. When his brigade next approaches the general's manor, Ryabovic walks up on a little bridge near the bathhouse, where he reaches out and touches a wet sheet, hanging there to dry. A sensation of cold and roughness assails him, and he glances down at the water, where a red moon is reflected. Staring at the flowing water, Ryabovic experiences a conviction that all of life is an incoherent joke. In the story's close, all the other officers have returned to the general's house, but Ryabovic goes to his solitary bed. Except for the kiss itself, that touch of the cold, wet sheet, the antichrist, as it were, is a dominant moment of the story. It destroys your Rabovic, but then so does the kiss. Hope and joy, however irrational, are stronger than despair, and ultimately more pernicious. I read the kiss and repeat to myself an observation that I once made in writing about Chekhov. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you despair, is Chekhov's gospel, except that this gloomy genius insists upon being cheerful. Ryabovic may think that his fate in life is settled, but it certainly isn't, though we will never know, since that lies beyond the story. 
The best observations on Chekhov, and on Tolstoy also, that I have ever read are in Maxim Gorky's reminiscences, where we are told, It seems to me that in the presence of Chekhov, everyone felt an unconscious desire to be simpler, more truthful, more himself. When I reread The Kiss or attend a good performance of Three Sisters, I am in Chekhov's presence. And while he doesn't make me simpler, more truthful, more myself, I do wish I could be better, though I can't be. My wish seems to me an aesthetic rather than a moral phenomenon, because Chekhov has a great writer's wisdom and teaches me implicitly that literature is a form of the good. Shakespeare and Beckett teach me the same, which is why I read. Sometimes I reflect on all of all the writers whose inner biographies are known. Chekhov and Beckett were the kindest human beings. Of Shakespeare's inner life, we knew nothing. But if you read the plays incessantly, then you suspect that this wisest of persons must be a third with Chekhov and Beckett. The creator of Sir John Falstaff, of Hamlet, and of Rosalind, in As You Like It, also makes me wish I could be more myself. But that, as I argue throughout this book, is why we should read and why we should read only the best of what has been written. The Kiss is an early work, however marvelous. Chekhov himself thought his best story was the three-page The Student, composed when he was 33, the age when Jesus died, according to tradition. Like Shakespeare, Chekhov cannot be called either a believer or a skeptic, they are too large for such a categorization. The student is ardently simple, though beautifully arranged. A young clerical student, cold and hungry, comes upon two wit widows, mother and daughter, on Good Friday. He warms himself at their campfire and tells them the story of how the Apostle Peter denied Jesus three times, as Jesus had prophesied. Peter, returning to himself, wept bitterly, and so does the widowed mother. The student goes off and broods on the relation between the apostles' tears and the mother's, which seem linked in an unbroken train. Joy suddenly stirs in the student, because he feels that truth and beauty persist in and by this chain that binds past to present. And that is all. The story ends with the student's transformation of this sudden joy into an expectation of a happiness still to come in his life. He was only 22, Chekhov dryly remarks, perhaps having an intimation that he himself, at 33, had already lived three quarters of his life. He died of tuberculosis at 44. The reader can reflect upon the subtle transition in the student's joy, from a past to present train of truth and beauty to a 22-year-old's anticipation of a not impossible personal happiness. It is Good Friday, and the tale within a tale is of Jesus and Simon Peter, and yet neither of the rejoicings has any trace of authentic piety or of salvation. Chekhov, the subtlest dramatic psychologist since Shakespeare himself, has written a dark lyric about suffering and change. Jesus is present only as a supreme representation of suffering and change, one that Shakespeare, in his dangerous era, shrewdly and invariably avoided. Why did Chekhov prefer this short story to scores of what seemed to be many of his admirers' far more consequential and vital tales? I have no clear answer, but regard the question as worthy of pondering. Nothing in the student except what happens in the protagonist's mind is anything but dreadfully dismal. It is the irrational rise of impersonal joy and personal hope out of cold and misery and the tears of betrayal that appear to have moved Chekhov himself. A late story. The Lady with the Dog of 1899 is among my favorites by Chekhov and is generally regarded as being one of his finest. 
Gurov, a married man vacationing alone in Yalta, the seaside resort, is moved by encountering a fair young woman always accompanied by her white Pomeranian. An incessant womanizer, Gurov begins an affair with the lady, Anna Sergeyevna, herself unhappily married. She departs, insisting that the farewell must be forever. Experienced amorist as he is, Gurov accepts this with an autumnal relief and returns to his wife and children in Moscow, only to find himself haunted and suffering. Has he fallen in love, presumably for the first time? He does not know, nor does Chekhov, so we cannot know either. Yet he is certainly obsessed and therefore travels to Anna Sergeyevna's provincial town, where he seeks her out when she attends the opera. Anguished, she urges him to go immediately, promising that she will visit him in Moscow. The Moscow meetings, every two or three months, become a tradition, enjoyable enough for Gurov, but hardly for the perpetually weeping Anna Sergeyevna. Until, at last, catching sight of himself in a mirror, Gurov sees that his hair is graying and simultaneously awakens to the incessant dilemma he has entered which he interprets as a belated falling in love. What is to be done? Gorov at once feels that he and his beloved are on the verge of a beautiful new life, and also that the end of the relationship is far off, and the hardest part of their mutual travail has just begun. That is all Chekhov gives us, but the reverberations go on long after this conclusion that concludes nothing. Gurov and Anna Sergeyevna are evidently both somewhat changed, but not necessarily for the better. Nothing either can do for the other is redemptive. What, then, redeems their story from its mundane staleness? How does it differ from the tale of every other hapless adultery? Not by our interest in Gurov and Anna, as any reader would have to conclude. There is nothing remarkable about them. He is another womanizer, and she another weeping woman. Chekhov's artistry is never more mysterious than here, where it is palpable yet scarcely definable. Clearly, Anna is in love, though Gurov is hardly a worthy object. Just how to value the mournful Anna we cannot know. What passes between the lovers is presented by Chekhov with such detachment that we lack not information but judgment including our own. For the story is weirdly laconic in its universalism. Does Gurov really believe that, at last, he has fallen in love? He has no clue, nor does the reader. And if Chekhov knows, he won't tell us. As in Shakespeare, where Hamlet tells us that he loves, and we don't know if we can believe him, we are not tempted to trust Gurov's assertion that this at last is a real right thing. Anna complains bitterly that theirs is a dark secret love, to use William Blake's great phrase from his The Sick Rose. But Gurov seems to revel in the secret life, which he thinks uncovers his true self. He is a banker, and doubtless many bankers have true selves, but Gurov isn't one of them. The reader can credit Anna's tears, but not Gurov's how, 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 as he clutches his head. Chekhov in love parodied himself in the seagulls, Trigorin, and I suggest that Gurov is a more transposed self-parody. We don't much like Gurov, and we want Anna to stop crying, but we cannot cast their story off, because it is our story. Gorky says of Chekhov that he was able to reveal in the dim sea of banality its tragic humor. It sounds naive, and yet Chekhov's greatest power is to give us the impression, as we read, that here at last is the truth about human existence's constant blend of banal misery and tragic joy. Shakespeare was Chekhov's and our authority on tragic joy, 
but the banal does not appear in Shakespeare, even when he writes travesty or farce. Guy de Maupassante Chekhov had learned from Maupassante how to represent banality. Maupassante, who has learned everything, including that, from his master, Flaubert, rarely matches the genius of Chekhov, or of Turgenev, as a storyteller. Lev Shestov, a remarkable Russian religious thinker of the earlier 20th century, expressed this with considerable force. Chekhov's wonderful art did not die. His art to kill by a mere touch, a breath, a glance, everything whereby men live and wherein they take their pride. And in the arts he was constantly perfecting himself, and he attained to a virtuosity beyond the reach of any of his rivals in European literature. Maupassant often had to strain every effort to overcome his victim. The victim often escaped from Maupassant, though crushed and broken, yet with his life. In Chekhov's hands, nothing escaped death. That is a very dark view, and no reader wants to think of herself as a writer's victim. And yet Shestov accurately weighs Maupassant against Chekhov, rather as one might weigh Christopher Marlowe against Shakespeare. Yet Maupassant is the best of the really popular story writers, vastly superior to O. Henry, who could be quite good, and greatly preferable to the abominable Poe. To be an artist the popular is itself an extraordinary achievement. We have nothing like it in the United States today. Chekhov can seem simple, but is always profoundly subtle. Many of Maupassant's simplicities are merely what they seem to be, yet they are not shallow. Maupassant had learned from his teacher, Flaubert, that talent is a prolonged patience, as seeing what others tend not to see. Whether Maupassant can make us see what we could never have seen without him, I very much doubt. That calls for the genius of Shakespeare, or of Chekhov. There is also the problem that Maupassant, like so many 19th century and early 20th century writers of fiction, saw everything through the lens of Arthur Schopenhauer, philosopher of the will to live. I would just as soon wear Schopenhauerian as Freudian goggles, both enlarge and both distort, almost equally. But I am a literary critic, not a story writer, and Maupassant would have done better to discard philosophical spectacles when he contemplated the vagaries of the desires of men and of women. At his best, he is marvelously readable, whether in the humorous pathos of Madame Tellier's establishment or in the horror story like The Horla, both of which I shall consider here. Frank O'Connor insisted that Maupassant's stories were not satisfactory when compared to those of Chekhov and Turgenev. But then few story writers rivaled the two Russian masters. O'Connor's real objection was that he thought the sexual act itself turns into a form of murder in Maupassant. A reader who had just enjoyed Madame Tellier's establishment would hardly agree. Flaubert, who did not live to write it, wished to set his final novel in a provincial whorehouse, which his son had already done in this robust story. Everyone in Madame Tellier's establishment is benign and amiable, which is part of the story's authentic charm. Madame Tellier, a respectable Norman peasant, keeps her establishment as one might run an inn or even a boarding school. Her five sex workers, as some call them now, are vividly, even lovingly described by Maupassant, who emphasizes the peace kept in the house by Madame's talent for conciliation and her incessant good humor. On an evening in May, 
none of the regular clients are in good humor because the establishment is festooned with a notice. Closed for our first communion. Madame and her staff had gone off for this event, the celebrant being Madame's niece and goddaughter. The first communion develops into an extraordinary occasion when the prolonged weeping of the whores, moved to remember their own girlhoods, becomes contagious, and the entire congregation is swept by an ecstasy of tears. The priest proclaims that the Holy Spirit has descended, and particularly thanks to visitors, Madame Tellier and her staff. After a boisterous trip back to their establishment, Madame and her ladies return to their original evening labors, performed, however, with more than the routine zest and in high good spirits. It isn't every day we have something to celebrate, Madame Tellier concludes the story by remarking, and only a joyless reader declines to celebrate with her. For once, at least. Schopenhauer's disciple has broken loose from gloomy reflections on the close relations between sex and death. Exuberance in storytelling is hard to resist, and Maupassant never writes with more gusto than in Madame Tellier's establishment. This tale of Normandy has warmth, laughter, surprise, and even a kind of spiritual insight. The Pentecostal ecstasy that burns through the congregation is as authentic as the weeping of the horse that ignited it. But Poisson's irony is markedly kinder, though less subtle, than his master Flaubert's. And the story is baldy, not prurient, in the Shakespearean spirit. It enlarges life and diminishes no one. But Poisson's own life ended badly. By his late twenties, he was syphilitic. At thirty-nine, the disease affected his mind, and he spent his final years locked in an asylum after a suicide attempt. His most upsetting horror story, The Horla, has a complex and ambiguous relation to his illness and its consequences. The nameless protagonist of the story is perhaps a syphilitic going mad, though nothing that Maupasson narrates actually tells us to make such an inference. At first person narration, the Horla gives us more clues than we can interpret, because we cannot understand the narrator and do not know whether we can trust his impressions, of which we receive little or no independent verification. The Horla begins with the narrator, a prosperous young Norman gentleman, persuading us of his happiness on a beautiful May morning. He sees the splendid Brazilian three-master boat flow by his house and salutes it. This gesture evidently summons the Horla, an invisible being that we later learn has been afflicting Brazil with demonic possession and subsequent madness. Horlas are evidently refined cousins of the vampires. They drink milk and water and drain vitality from sleepers without actually drawing blood. Whatever has been happening in Brazil, we are free to doubt precisely what is going on in Normandy. Our narrator eventually sets fire to his own house to destroy the Horla, but neglects to tell the servants who are consumed with their home. When the tale-teller apprehends that his Horla is still alive, he concludes by telling us that he will have to kill himself. Clearly, it is indeed his Horla, whether or not it made the voyage from Brazil to Normandy. The Horla is a narrator's madness, and not just a cause of madness. Has Maupassant written the story of what it means to be possessed by syphilis? At one point, the sufferer glances in the mirror and cannot see his reflection. Then he sees himself in a mist at the back of the mirror. The mist recedes until he sees himself completely, and of the mist or blocking agent, he cries out, I had seen him! The narrator says that the Horla is adamant 
means that the reign of man is over. Magnetism, hypnotism, suggestion are all aspects of the whoreless will. He has come, the victim cries out, and suddenly the interloper shouts his name in one's ears. The Horla, he has come. Maupassant invents the name Horla, is in an ironic play upon the English word whore that seems very remote, unless indeed Maupassant's venereal disease is the story's hidden center. The horror story is a large and fascinating genre in which Maupassant excelled, but never again as powerfully as in the Horla. I think that it is because, on some level, he knew that he prophesied his own madness and attempted suicide. Bapasan is not of the artistic eminence of Turgenev, Chekhov, Henry James, or Hemingway as a short story writer, but his immense popularity is well deserved. Someone who created both Madame Tellier's establishment with its amiable es ecstasies and the Horla with its convincing fright, who was a permanent master of the story. Why read Maupassant? At his best, he will hold you as few others do. You receive pretty much what his narrative voice gives you. It is not God's plenty, but it pleases many and serves as an introduction to the more difficult pleasures of storytellers subtler than Maupassant. Ernest Hemingway Hemingway's best short stories surpass even The Sun Also Rises, his only novel that seems now to be something more than a period piece. Wallace Stevens, the strongest of modern American poets, once termed Hemingway the most significant of living poets, so far as the subject of extraordinary reality is concerned. By poet, here, Stevens meant the remarkable stylist of Hemingway's short stories. And by extraordinary reality, he meant a poetic realm in which consciousness takes the place of imagination. This high praise is merited by Hemingway's permanent achievements in the short story, some 15 or so masterpieces, easy to parody, frequently by Hemingway himself, but impossible to forget. Frank O'Connor, who disliked Hemingway as intensely as he liked Chekhov, remarks in The Lonely Voice that Hemingway's stories illuminate a technique in search of a subject and therefore become a minor art. Let us see. Read the famous sketch called Hills Like White Elephants. Five pages that are almost all dialogue between a young woman and her lover while they wait for a train at a station in a provincial Spanish town. They are continuing a disagreement as to the abortion he wishes her to undergo when they reach Madrid. The story catches the moment of her defeat, and very likely of the death of their relationship. And that is all. The dialogue makes clear that the woman is vital and decent, while the man is a sensible emptiness, selfish and unloving. The reader is wholly with her when she responds to his I'd do anything for you with Would you please, 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 please stop talking? Seven pleases are a lot, but as repetition they are precise and persuasive in Hills Like White Elephants. The story is beautifully prefigured in the simile of a title. Long and white, the hills across a valley of the Ebro looks like white elephants, to the woman, not to the man. White elephants, proverbial Siamese royal gifts to courtiers who would be ruined by the expense of their upkeep, become a large metaphor for unwanted babies, and even more for erotic relationships too spiritually costly when a man is inadequate. Hemingway's Personal Mystique his bravura poses as a warrior, big game hunter, bullfighter, 
in Boxer is as irrelevant to hills like white elephants as its male protagonist's insistence that, you know I love you. More relevant is the remark of Hemingway's surrogate, Nick Adams, in The End of Something, when he terminates a relationship. It isn't fun anymore. I don't know many woman readers who like that sentence, but it hardly is an apologia. Only a very young man's self indictment The Hemingway story that wounds me most is another five-pager, God Rest You Mary, Gentlemen, which is almost entirely dialogue, after its opening paragraphs, including an outrageous initial sentence. In those days, the distances were all very different. The dirt blew off the hills that now have been cut down, and Kansas City was very like Constantinople. You can parody that by saying, in those days, Bridgeport, Connecticut, was very like Haifa. Still, we are in Kansas City on Christmas Day, and listening to the conversation between two physicians, the incompetent Dr. Wilcox, who relies upon a limp, letter-indexed volume, the young doctor's friend and guide, and the mordant Doc Fisher, who begins by quoting his corligionist Shylock. What news along the Rialto? The news is very bad, as we learn soon enough. A boy of about 16, obsessed with purity, had come into the hospital to ask for castration. Turned away, he had mutilated himself with a razor and will probably die from loss of blood. The interest in the story centers in Doc Fisher's lucid nihilism, prophetic of Nathaniel West's shrike in Miss Lonely Hearts. Ride you, doctor, on the day, the very anniversary of our Savior's birth. Our Savior? Ain't you a Jew? Dr. Wilcox said. So I am, so I am. It always is slipping my mind. I've never given it its proper importance. So good of you to remind me. Your savior. That's right. Your savior. Undoubtedly your savior. In the ride for Palm Sunday. You, Wilcox, are the donkey upon whom I ride into Jerusalem. Is the implication of that last phrase. Rancid and brilliant, Doc Fisher has peaked, as he says into hell. His Shylockian intensity is a Hemingway-esque tribute to Shakespeare, described by Colonel Cantwell's Hemingway surrogate in Across the River and Into the Trees, as the winner and still the undisputed champion. When he is most ambitious in the stories, Hemingway is most Shakespearean, as in the famous quasi-autobiographical The Snows of Kilimanjaro its author's favorite. Of the story's protagonist, the failed writer Harry, Hemingway observes, he had loved too much, demanded too much, and he wore it all out. That would be a superb remark to make about King Lear, Hemingway's most admired character in all of Shakespeare. More than anywhere else, Hemingway attempts and achieves tragedy in the relatively brief compass of the snows of Kilimanjaro. The meditation of a dying man rather than the description of an action, this Baroque story is Hemingway's most intense self-chastisement, and I think that Chekhov himself, much given to that mode, would have been impressed by it. One doesn't think of Hemingway as a visionary writer, but the snows of Kilimanjaro begins with an epigraph telling us that the snow-covered western summit of the mountain is called the House of God, and close to it is the carcass, dried and frozen, of a leopard. There is no explanation as to what a leopard could have been seeking nearly 20,000 feet above sea level. Very little is gained by saying that the leopard is a symbol of the dying hairy, Originally, in ancient Greek, 
and Symbolon was a token for identification that could be compared to a counterpart. Commonly, we use symbol more loosely as something that stands for something else, whether by association or resemblance. If you identify the corpse of the leopard with Harry's lost but still residual ambition or aesthetic idealism as a writer, then you plunge Hemingway's story into bathos and gross teakery. Hemingway himself did that in The Old Man and the Sea, but not in the masterful The Snows of Kilimanjaro. Harry is dying, slowly, of gangrene in an African hunting camp, surrounded by vultures and hyenas, probably unpleasant presences that need not to be interpreted as symbolic. Neither need the leopard be so interpreted. Like Harry, it is out of place. But the writer's vision of Kilimanjaro does seem another of Hemingway's nostalgic visions of a lost spirituality, qualified as always by a keen sense of nothingness, a Shakespearean nihilism. It seemed useful to regard the uncanny presence of the dead leopard as a strong irony, a forerunner of Harry's vain quest to recover his identity as a writer at Kilimanjaro, rather than, say, at Paris, Madrid, Key West, or Havana. The irony is at Hemingway's own expense, insofar as Harry prophesizes the Hemingway who, 19 days short of his 62nd birthday, turned a double barrel shotgun on himself in the mountains of Idaho. Yet the story is not primarily ironical and need not to be read as a personal prophecy. Harry is a failed Hemingway. Hemingway, by being able to compose The Slows of Kilimanjaro, is precisely not a failure at least as a writer. The best moment in the story is hallucinatory. It comes just before the end. It is Harry's dying vision, though the reader cannot know that, until Harry's wife, Helen, realizes she can no longer hear him breathing. As he died, Harry dreamed that the rescue plane had come for him, but could only carry one passenger. On the visionary flight, Harry is taken up to see the square top of Kilimanjaro. Great, high, and unbelievably white in the sun. This apparent image of transcendence is his most elusive moment in the story. It represents death, and not the house of God. A dying man's phantasmagoria is not to be regarded as triumphical. When the entire story conveys Harry's conviction, that he has wasted his gifts as a writer. Yet Hemingway may have remembered King Lear's dying fantasy, in which the old mad king is persuaded that his beloved daughter Cordelia breathes again, despite her murder. If you love too much, or demand too much, then you, like Lear and Harry, and at last Hemingway, will wear it all out. Fantasy, for Harry, takes the place of art. Hemingway was so wonderful and unexpected a story writer that I choose to end my account of him here with one of his unknown masterpieces, the splendidly ironic A Sea Change, which prefigures his posthumously published novel The Garden of Eden with its portrayal of ambiguous sexualities. In A Sea Change, we are in a Parisian bar, where an archetypal Hemingway-esque couple are engaged in a crisp dialogue on infidelity. It takes the reader only a few exchanges to realize that the sea change of the title does not refer to the woman who is determined to begin or continue a lesbian relationship, yet wishes to also to return to the man. It is the man who is suffering a sea change, presumably into the writer who will compose the rich and strange The Garden of Eden. I'm a different man, he twice announces to the uncomprehending bartender after the woman has left. Looking into the mirror, he sees the difference, but what he sees we are not told. Though he remarks to the bartender that vice is a very strange thing. It cannot be a consciousness of vice that has made him a different man. Rather, it is his imaginative yielding to the woman's persuasive defense that has altered him forever. We're made up of all sorts of things. You know that. You used it well enough, she said to him. 
and he tacitly acknowledges some crucial element in the sexuality they have shared. He suffers now a sea change, but nothing of him fades in this moment of only apparent loss. Almost too deft for irony, a sea change is a subtle self-recognition, an erotic autobiography remarkable for its indirection and its nuanced self-acceptance. Only the finest American master of the short story could have placed so much in so slight a sketch. Flannery O'Connor D.H. Lawrence, a superb writer of short stories, gave the reader a permanent wisdom in one brief remark. Trust the tale, not the teller. That seems to me an essential principle in reading the stories of Flannery O'Connor, who may have been the most original tale teller among Americans since Hemingway. Her sensibility was an extraordinary blend of Southern Gothic and severe Roman Catholicism. So fierce a moralist is O'Connor that readers need to be wary of her tendentiousness. She has too palpable a design upon us, to shock us by violence into a need for traditional faith. As teller, O'Connor was very shrewd, yet I think her best tales are far shrewder and enforce no moral except an awakened moral imagination. O'Connor's South is wildly Protestant, not the Protestantism of Europe, but of the indigenous American religion, whether it calls itself Baptist, Pentecostal, or whatever. The prophets of that religion, snake handlers, free-thinking Christians, independent prophets, the swindlers, the mad, and sometimes the genuinely inspired, O'Connor named as natural Catholics. Except for this handful of Natural Catholics, the people who throng O'Connor's marvelous stories are the damned, a category in which Flannery O'Connor cheerfully included most of her readers. I think that the best way to read her stories is to begin by acknowledging that one is among her damned, then go on from there to enjoy her gross teak and unforgettable art of telling. A good man is hard to find, remains a splendid introduction to O'Connor. A grandmother, her son, and daughter-in-law and their three children are on a charred journey when they encounter an escaped convict, the misfit, and his two subordinate killers. Upon seeing the misfit, the grandmother foolishly declares his identity, thus dooming herself and all her family. The old lady pleads with the misfit while her family is taken away to be shot. But O'Connor gives us one of her masterpieces in this natural theologian of a killer, Jesus, the misfits declares, thrown everything off balance by raising the dead in a cosmos where there is no pleasure but meanness. Dizzy and hallucinating, the terrified grandmother touches the misfit while murmuring, Why, you're one of my babies. You're one of my own children. He recoils, shoots her three times in the chest, and pronounces her epitaph. She would have been a good woman if it had been somebody there to shoot her every minute of her life. The tale and the teller came together here. Since the misfits clearly speaks for something fierce and funny in O'Connor herself. O'Connor gives us a hypocritical and banal old lady, and a killer who is, in O'Connor's view, an instrument of Catholic grace. This is meant to be and certainly is outrageous because, being damned, we are outraged by it. We would be good, O'Connor thinks, if someone were there to shoot us every minute of our lives. Why do we not resent O'Connor's palpable designs upon us? Her comic genius is certainly part of the answer. Someone who can entertain us so profoundly can damn us pretty much as she pleases. In her... Good country people, we meet the unfortunate Joy Hopewell, who possesses both a PhD in philosophy in a wooden leg, and the fancy first name Holga, which she had given herself. A brash young Bible salesman, with an improbably phallic name, Manly Pointer, 
divests Holga of her wooden leg in a haystack, and then runs off with it. Holga accurately knows herself as of the damned. Is she not a philosopher? And we can draw what moral we will from her cruelly hilarious fate. Shall we say of her, she would have been a good woman if it had been somebody there to seduce her and run off with her wooden leg every minute of her life. O'Connor would have disdained my skepticism, and I am aware that my parody is defensive. But her early stories, though lively, are not her greatest. That comes in later work as A View of the Woods and Parker's Back. And in her second novel, The Violent Bear It Away. A View of the Woods is a sublimely ugly tale featuring the 79-year-old Mr. Fortune and his nine-year-old granddaughter, Mary Fortune Pitts. Both are dreadful, selfish, stubborn, meek, sullen monuments of pride. At the story's end, a nasty fight between the two closes with the grandfather killing the little girl, having throttled her and smashed her head upon a rock. In his excitement and exhaustion, Mr. Fortune has a final view of the woods during a fatal heart attack. This is all grimly impressive, but how should we interpret it? O'Connor remarked that Mary Fortune Pitts was saved and Mr. Fortune damned, but she could not explain why, since they are equally abominable persons, and the death struggle might have gone either way. It is splendid that O'Connor was so outrageous because our skepticism outraged her and inspired her art. And yet her obsessive spirituality and absolute moral judgments cannot just sustain themselves at the reader's expense. But when I think that, I suddenly recall how close her literary tastes were to my own. She preferred Faulkner's As I Lay Dying and Nathaniel West's Miss Lonely Hearts to all other works of modern American fiction. And so do I. Reading Flannery O'Connor's stories and The Violence Bear It Away, I am exhilarated to the brink of fear, as I am by Faulkner and West in their grandest works, and by Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian, which surely O'Connor would have admired had she survived to read it. Turgenev and Chekhov, Maupassant and Hemingway, were not ideologues, and the main tradition of the modern short stories is certainly theirs and not O'Connor's. And yet her verve and drive, the propulsive gusto of her comic spirit, is overwhelming. Her Catholicism might as well be holy rollerism, so far as the aesthetic effect of her fiction is concerned. There we can locate her natural shrewdness. Her mad and damned American religionists can be parodied, but the parody will not touch her assured Roman Catholicism. More than a comedian of genius, she had also the penetrating insight that religion for her countrymen and women was not the opiate, but rather the poetry of the people. Vladimir Nabokov I pass on to a superb story by Vladimir Nabokov the Vane sisters, because this transition refreshes me, going from a vision of spirituality through violence to an aestheticism that plays with spiritualism. Nabokov was given to lamenting that his American English could never match the richness of his native Russian style, a lament that seems an irony when the reader confronts the baroquely rich textures of the Vane sisters. Our narrator, himself French in origin, instructs in French literature at a New England women's college. Nabokovian through and through, this nameless narrator is a finicky esthete, a harmless version of Oscar Wilde's Dorian Gray. The Vane sisters are Cynthia and Sybil, whose name and suicide are borrowed from Dorian Gray's victimized girlfriend though both young women are more Henry Jamesian than Wildean, since they are evanescent 
and indirect personalities. The nameless French professor was a teacher of Sybil, and the strange close friend of Cynthia, but the lover of Niter. The narrator begins with a chance hearing of Cynthia's death by heart attack. He is taking his usual Sunday afternoon stroll and stops to watch a family of brilliant icicles dripping down from the eaves of a frame house. A long paragraph is devoted to these icicles, and later he observes the lean ghost, the elongated umbra cast by a parking meter upon some damp snow, had a strange ruddy tinge. At the story's end, he wakes from a vague dream of Cynthia, but cannot unravel it. I could isolate, consciously, little. Everything seemed blurred, yellow-clouded, yielding, nothing tangible. Her inept acrostics, modeling evasions, theopathies. Every recollection formed ripples of mysterious meaning. Everything seemed yellowly blurred. Elusive. Lost. The self-parody of Nabokov's own style here testifies that Sybil's acrostics are not as inept as Cynthia's. Work out the acrostic formed by the initial letters of this passage, and you get Icicles by Cynthia. Meter from me. Sybil. A narrator is haunted then by both women, but why? Probably because the Vane sisters glided ghost-like through their existence anyway. Death seems hardly to alter them. But why the French professor as the object of these charmingly mischievous shades? It is possible that the narrator, being a Nabokovian self-parody, is being punished for Nabokov's own aestheticism and skepticism. And like Maupassant's The Horla, which represents a gathering madness, The Vain Sisters is an authentic, though highly original, ghost story. Sybil Vane, the day after taking a mid-year examination in French literature, given by the narrator, kills herself, in reaction to being abandoned by her married lover. We get to know the older sister, Cynthia, rather better, after Sybil's death. Cynthia is a painter and a spiritualist, and has evolved the theory of intervenient auras. These auras of the deceased intervene benignly in the lives of their survivors. After the narrator's skepticism alienates Cynthia, she also accurately calls him a prick and a snob. He breaks with her. It forgets her until he is told of her death. Discreetly, she haunts him until the climactic dream he cannot decipher in the final acrostic, which we can. The book of story, though brief, is replete with literary allusions to Emerson's transparent eyeball from his nature and Coolridge's person from Porlock who supposedly interrupted the composition of Kubla Khan. There are also vivid manifestations of Oscar Wilde and of Tolstoy at a seance, and an extraordinary general atmosphere of literary preciosity. What makes the Vane sisters magical is that the reader's own skepticism is overcome by the curious charm of these amiable women whose existences, and after auras, alike are so tenuous. The reader is separated by Nabokov from the narrator's priggishness, but not necessarily from his skepticism. Pragmatically, though, skepticism makes little difference here. These ghosts are persuasive precisely because they are so uninsistent upon persuasion. One doesn't think of the author of Pale Fire and Lolita as a Chekhovian writer, the book of adored Nikolai Gogol, whose spirit was fiercer and more lunatic than Chekhov's. But Cynthia and Sybil Vane will be at home in Chekhov. Like so many of his women, they represent the pathos of the unlived life. 
the book of, not so much interesting in pathos, prefers them as whimsical ghosts. Jorge Luis Borges The modern short story, so long as it remains Chekhovian, is impressionistic. This is as true of James Joyce's Dubliners as it is of Hemingway or Flannery O'Connor. Perception and sensation, the aesthetic of Walter Palter, are centered in the impressionistic short story, including the major stories of Thomas Mann and Henry James. Something very different came into modern storytelling with the phantasmagoria of Franz Kafka, a prime precursor of Jorge Luis Borges, who can be said to have replaced Chekhov as a major influence upon the short stories of the second half of our century. Stories now tend to be either Chekhovian or Borgesian. Only rarely are they both. Borges's collected fictions insist always upon their self-conscious status as artifices, and like Chekhov's impressionistic glances at the truths of our existence. The reader, encountering Borges and his many followers, is wise to entertain very different expectations than she brings to Chekhov and his vast school. One is not going to hear the lonely voice of a submerged element in the population, but rather a voice haunted by a plethora of literary voices, forerunners. What greater glory for a god than to be absolved of the world, is Borges' great outcry as he professes his Alexandrianism. If there is a god in Chekhov's stories, then he cannot be absolved of the world, nor can we. But for Borges, the world is a speculative illusion or a labyrinth or a mirror reflecting other mirrors. How to read Borges is necessarily more a lesson in how to read all his precursors than it is an exercise in self-understanding. That does not make Borges less entertaining or less enlightening than Chekhov, but it does make him very different. For Borges, Shakespeare is at once everyone and nobody. He is a living labyrinth of literature itself. For Chekhov, Shakespeare is obsessively the author of Hamlet, and Prince Hamlet becomes the ship in which Chekhov sails, quite literally in At Sea, the first story published under Chekhov's own name. Borges's relativism is an absolute. Chekhov's is conditional. The reader enthralled by Chekhov and his disciples, can enjoy a personal relation to the story, but Borges enchants the reader into the realm of impersonal forces, where Shakespeare's own memory is a vast abyss into which one can tumble, losing whatever remnants exist of one's self. Of Borges's fictions, every reader will create a select list. Mine include Talon, Ugbar, Orbis Tertius, Pierre Menard, author of the Quixote, Death and the Compass, The South, The Immortal, and The Alephi. Of this half dozen, I will center here only upon the first, in some detail so as to help culminate this section on how to read the short story and why we need to go on reading the best examples of it that we can find. Talon, Agbar, Orbis Tertius begins with a disarming sentence in Andrew Hurley's eloquent translation. I owe the discovery of Agbar to the conjunction of a mirror and an encyclopedia. That sentence is a purist Borges, and a labyrinth to a mirror in an encyclopedia, and you would have his world. Of all Borges' fictions, Talon, Ugbar, Orbis Tertius is the most sublimely outrageous. And yet the reader is seduced into finding the incredible credible, 
because of Borges' skill at employing real people, his best and most literary friends, in places, a big old country house, the National Library, a familiar hotel. The reader grants the same natural reality to the fictive Herbert, Ash, as to the actual Bio Caceres. While Akbar and Talon, though phantasmagorias, seem little more marvelous than the National Library, an encyclopedia that deals entirely with an invented world goes a long way towards verifying that world simply because it is an encyclopedia, a work to which we are accustomed to grant authority. This is disconcerting, but in a diverting way. As Salonian objects and concepts spread through the nations, reality caves in. Borges's dry irony is never more imposing. The truth is, it wanted to cave in. Ten years ago, any symmetry, any system with an appearance of order, dialectical materialism, anti-Semitism, Nazism, could spellbind and hypnotize mankind. Borges, a firm opponent both of Marxism and of Argentine fascism, indicts what we called reality, but not his fantasy of Talon, which is part of the living labyrinth of imaginative literature. Talon may well be a labyrinth, but it is a labyrinth forged by men, a labyrinth destiny to be deciphered by men. That is to say, Talon is a benign labyrinth where no minotaur waits at the end of the maze to devour us. Canonical literature is neither a symmetry nor a system, but a hugely proliferating encyclopedia of human desire, the desire to be more imaginative rather than to hurt another self. We are not to be spellbound nor hypnotized by Talon, and yet as readers we are not given nearly enough information to decipher it. Talon remains precisely a vast cipher to be solved only by the entire literary universe as Fantasia. Borges' story begins when he and his closest friend and sometime collaborator, the Argentine novelist Bio Caceres, sits too late at dinner in Borges' rented country house and together behold themselves in a mirror which unsettles them. Bioy remembers a saying that he attributes to one of the heresiarchs of Ugbar. Mirrors and copulation are abominable, for they multiply the number of mankind. We are never told the identity of this Gnostic ascetic, who necessarily is Borges himself, but Bioy thinks he found the saying in the article on Ugbar, in what purported to be a reprint, under another title of the 1902 Encyclopedia Britannica. The article does not appear in the edition available in Borges' rented house. The next day, Bioy brings his own, relevant volume, which contains four pages on Ugbar. The geography and history of Ugbar are alike rather vague. The location appears to be Transcaucasian, while the literature of Ugbar is holy fantasy and refers to the imaginary realms, including Talon. There the story, barely begun, would end, but for the aptly named Herbert Ash, a reticent British engineer with whom Borges says he had desultory conversations across eight years at a hotel both frequented. After Ash's death, Borges finds a volume that the engineer had left in the hotel bar, a first encyclopedia of Talon, volume XI, Liar to John. The book has no place or date of publication and contains 1,001 pages in clear allusion to the Arabian Nights. Absorbing these mythical pages, Borges discovers much of the nature, to call it that, of the cosmos that is Talon. Bishop Berkeley's fierce philosophical idealism, with its conviction that nothing could be an idea except another idea, is a primordial law of existence on Talon. There are no causes or effects in that cosmos. The psychology and metaphysics of absolute fantasy prevail. Such was Talon, Akbar, 
Orbis Tertius in 1940, another item in Borges' Anthology of Fantastic Literature. A postscript dated 1947 expands on the phantasmagoria. Talon ex is explained as a benign conspiracy of hermetists and Kabbalists across three centuries, but one that took its decisive turn in 1824 when the reclusive millionaire Ezra Buckley proposed that an imaginary country be converted into an invented universe. Borges sets the proposal in Memphis, Tennessee, thereby making what we now think of as Elvis land as mysterious as ancient Memphis, Egypt. The 40 volumes of the first encyclopedia of Talon are completed by 1914, the year that saw the onset of World War I. In 1942, in the midst of World War II, the first objects from Talon began to appear. A magnetic compass whose dial letters are in the Talosian alphabet. A small metal cone of unbearable weight. The discovery in the Memphis Library of a complete set of the encyclopedia. Other objects, made of unearthly material, flood the nations. Reality caves in, and the world and time will be Talon. Borges, little moved, stays in his hotel, slowly revising a Baroque translation of Sir Thomas Brown's Ernia Burio. Life is a pure flame, and we live by an invisible sun within us. Borges, a skeptical visionary, charms us even as we accept his warning. Reality caves in all too easily. Our individual fantasies may not be as elaborate as Talon, nor as abstract. Yet Borges has sketched a universal tendency and fulfilled a fundamental yearning as to why we read. Tommaso Landolfi Dostoevsky famously said, we all come from under Gogol's overcoat, a short story concerning a wretched copying clerk whose new overcoat is stolen. Disdained by the authorities, to whom he dully protests, the poor fellow dies, after which his ghost continues to search vainly for justice. Good as the story is, it is not the best of Gogol, which may be old-world landowners, or the insane, the nose which begins when a barber at breakfast discovers a customer's nose inside a loaf of bread freshly baked by his wife. The spirit of Gogol, suddenly alive in much of Nabokov, achieves its apotheosis in the triumphant Gogol's wife by the modern Italian story writer Tommaso Landolfi, perhaps the funniest and most unnerving story that I've yet read. The narrator Gogol's friend and biographer reluctantly tells us the story of Gogol's wife. The actual Gogol, a religious obsessive, never married, and deliberately starved himself to death at 43 or so after burning his unpublished manuscripts. But Landolfi's Gogol, who might have been invented by Kafka or by Borges, has married a rubber balloon, the splendidly inflatable dummy who assumes different shapes and sizes at her husband's whim. Much in love with his wife, in one of her forms or another, Gogol enjoys sexual relations with her and bestows upon her the name Caracas, after the capital of Venezuela, for reasons known only to the mad writer. For some years, all goes well, until Gogol contracts syphilis, which he rather unfairly blames upon Caracas. Ambivalence towards his silent wife gains steadily in Gogol through the years. He accuses Caracas of self-gratification and even betrayal, so that she becomes bitter and excessively religious. Finally, the enraged Gogol pumps too much air into Caracas, quite deliberately, until she bursts and scatters into the air. Collecting the remains of Madame Gogol, the great writer burns them in the fireplace where they share the fate of his unpublished works. Into the same fire, Gogol casts also a rubber balloon, the son of Caracas. After this final catastrophe, the biographer defends Gogol from the charge of wife-beating. 
and salutes the memory of the writer's lofty genius. The best prelude, or postlude, to reading Landolfi's Gogol's Wife is to read some stories by Gogol, on the basis of which we will not doubt the reality of the unfortunate Caracas. She is as likely a paramour as Gogol could ever have discovered, or invented, for himself. In contrast, Landolfi could hardly have composed much the same story and called it Maupassant's wife, let alone Turgenev's wife. No, it has to be Gogol and Gogol alone, and I rarely doubt Landolfi's story, particularly just after each rereading. Caracas has a reality that Borges neither seeks nor achieves for his salon. As Gogol's only possible bride, she seems to me the ultimate parody of Frank O'Connor's insistence that, that the lonely voice crying out in the modern short story is that of the submerged population. Who could be more submerged than Gogol's wife? Italo Calvino Other masters than the short story are considered elsewhere in the volume. Whether as novelists, Henry James and Thomas Mann, or poets, D. H. Lawrence. Here I wish to close with another great Italian fabulist, Italo Calvino, who died in 1985. My favorite among his books, really a universal favorite, is Invisible Cities, translated beautifully by William Weaver in 1974. A description of Calvino's invention, if rendered properly, could show others how and why invisible cities should be read and reread. Marco Polo is a tale teller, and the venerable Kublai Khan his audience, as we listened also to stories about imaginary cities. The stories are only a page or two long, yet they are short stories. In the Borgesian or Kafkan, rather than Chekhovian, mode. Marco Polo's cities never were, and never could be, and yet most readers would go there, if only we might. Calvino's Invisible Cities comes in eleven groupings, scattered rather than bunched. Cities and memory, desire, signs, eyes, names, the dead, the sky, as well as thin cities, trading cities, continuous cities, and hidden cities. Though one can become dizzy keeping all these in mind, it will not do to say that each of these cities is actually the same place. Since they are all named for women, that would amount to saying that all women are one woman, the doctrine of the Spanish philosopher, novelist, Miguel de Unamuno, but not Calvino's view. Kublai Khan, listening to Marco Polo, would certainly agree with Calvino and Polo, and not with Unamuno. For Kublai, old and weary of power, finds in Marco Polo's visionary cities a pattern that will endure after his own empire is dust. Nostalgia for lost illusions, loves that never quite were, happiness perhaps only tasted, these are the emotions Calvino evokes. In Isidora, one of the cities of memory, the foreigner hesitating between two women always encounters a third. But alas, you can arrive at Isidora only in old age. You leave Tamara without having discovered it. And in Zerma, you see a girl walking with a puma on a leash. Kublai, after many recitals, begin to know a family resemblance among the cities. But that means only that the emperor is learning how to interpret Polo's art of narrative. There is no language without the seat. In Armilla, one of the thin cities, the only activity seems to be that of nymphs bathing. In the morning you hear them singing. This is bettered by a voluptuous vibration constantly stirs Chloe the most chaste of cities. This is akin to one of Marco Polo's principles as a storyteller. Falsehood is never in words, 
It is in the things. Kublai protests that from then on, he will describe the cities, and Marco Polo will then journey to see if they exist. But Marco denies Kublai's archetypal city and proposes instead a model made only of exceptions, exclusions, incongruities, contradictions. The reader begins to understand that the true story is the ongoing debates between the visionary Marco and the skeptical Kublai, perpetual youth against eternal age. And so the recital goes on, Esmeralda, where cats, thieves, illicit lovers move along tire, discontinuous ways dropping from a rooftop to a balcony. Or Eusapia, a city of the dead, where a girl with a laughing skull milks the carcass of a heifer. Wary and even of this, Kublai orders Marco to seize his travels, and instead engage the great Khan in an endless chess match. But this does not slow Marco down. The movement of the chess pieces becomes the narrative of the invisible cities. We come at last to Baroness, the unjust city which has a just city within it, and an unjust city within that, and on and on. Baroness is then a sequence of cities, just and unjust, but all the future Baronesses are present already, wrapped one within the other, confined, crammed, inextricable. And since that is where we all live, Marco Polo seizes. There are then no more invisible cities. One final dialogue between Kublai and Marco remains. Where, Kublai asks, are the promised lands? Why has Marco not spoken of new Atlantis, Utopia, the city of the sun, new harmony, and all the other cities of redemption? For these parts, I could not draw a route on the map or set a date for the landing, Marco replies. But already the great Khan, leafing through his atlas, comes upon the cities of nightmares and maledictions. Babylon, Yahuland, Brave New World, and the others. In despair, the age Kublai states his nihilism. The current draws us at last to the infernal city. Wonderfully, the last words are given to Polo, who speaks for what is still hopeful in the reader. We are indeed already in the inferno of the living, we can accept it and so cease to be conscious of it. But there is a better way, and it might be called the wisdom of Italo Cavino. Seek and learn to recognize who and what in the mist of inferno are not inferno. Then make them endure. Give them space. Calvino's advice tells us again how to read and why. Be vigilant apprehend and recognize the possibility of the good, help it to endure, give it space in your life. It is useful to consider modern short stories as dividing themselves into rival traditions, Chekhovian and Borgesian. Flannery O'Connor, despite surface appearances, is as much in Chekhov's tradition as Italo Calvino is in the rival line of Kafka and Borges. The Chekhovian short story is not fantasy, however outrageous it turns in the work of Flannery O'Connor. Hemingway, who wanted to be Tolstoy, is very Chekhovian, as was Joyce's The Blinners, though Joyce denied he had read Chekhov. Chekhovian stories start off suddenly and elliptically and do not bother to fill in the gaps that we would expect to find closed up in the stories, particularly the longer ones of Henry James. Still, Chekhov expects you to believe in his realism, his faithfulness to our ordinary existence. Kafka and Borges after him invest themselves in phantasmagoria. Kafka and Borges do not give you dirge for the unlived life. It is not always easy to distinguish the Chekhovian Hemingway-esque mode from the Kafkan Borgesian, but neither style of narration is necessarily interested in telling you a story as Tolstoy so thoroughly and completely tells you the, of the life and death of Haji Murad, 
the Chechen hero in the short novel named after him. Chekhov and Kafka create from an abyss a void. Tolstoy's superb sense of reality persuades you as only Shakespeare and Cervantes can. But short stories, whether of the Chekhovian or Borgesian kind, constitutes an essential form, as Bar has remarked. The best of them demand and reward many rereadings. Henry James observed that short stories are placed at the exquisite points where poetry ends and reality begins. That puts them between poetry and novels, and their characters, as James again said, must be so strangely, fascinatingly particular, and yet so recognizably general. Plays traditionally imitate actions. Short stories frequently do not. Eudora Welty, probably our best living American storyteller, remarked that D.H. Lawrence's characters don't really speak their words, not conversationally, not to one another. They are not speaking on the street, but are playing like fountains, or radiating like the moon, or storming like the sea, or their silence is a silence of wicked rocks. Lawrence is a visionary extremist, but Welty's eloquent point is well taken for all great stories, which must find their own form, whether Chekhovian or Kafkan. In major short stories, reality becomes fantastic and phantasmagoria becomes discerningly mundane. That may be why so many readers these days shy away from volumes of stories and purchase novels instead even when the stories are of much higher quality. Short stories favor the tacit. They compel the reader to be active and to discern explanations that the writer avoids. The reader, as I have said before, must slow down quite deliberately and start listening with the inner ear. Such listening overhears the characters as well as hearing them. Think of them as your characters and wonder at what is implied rather than told about them. Unlike most figures in novels, their foregrounding and postgrounding are largely up to you, utilizing the hints subtly provided by the writer. From Turgenev through Yudora Welty and beyond, short story writers refrain from moral judgments. George Eliot was one of the finest of novels. In Middle March, her masterpiece abounds in fascinating moral judgments. But the most skilled short story writers are as elliptical in regard to moral judgments as they are in regard to continuities of action or the details of a character's past life. You, as reader, are to decide if moral judgments is relevant, and then the judgment will be yours to make. The reader derives immense benefits from the significant blanks provided both by the Chekhovian and the Borgesian mode. At the same time, one has to be wary of supposed symbolism, which is more often absent than present in a masterful short story. Even the great horror story, the Horla, of Maupassant does not overtly render the Horla symbolic. Though I have suggested above, that there may be some relation between Maupassant's syphilitic madness and his nameless protagonist's obsession with the Horla. To a certain degree, symbolism is as foreign to the good short story as literary allusion should be. Labokov is a superbly outrageous exception to my attempt to formulate a Bloom's Law for short fiction. Labokov is frequently elusive, though rarely symbolic. Symbolism is dangerous for short stories, since novels can have world enough and time to mask emblems naturalistically. But stories, necessarily more abrupt, have difficulty in rendering them unobtrusive. I conclude this epilogue to the how and why of reading the short story by offering the double judgment that the Chekhovian, Hemingwayesque, and Bohesian modes need never be preferred one to the other. We want them for different needs. If the first gratifies our hunger for reality, 
The second teaches us how ravenous we still are for what is beyond supposed reality. Clearly, we read the two schools differently, questing for truth with Chekhov, or for the turning inside out of truth with the Kafkan Borgesians. Landolfi's Gogol destroys his rubber doll of a wife, and we are as strongly affected as we are when Chekhov's student stops by the campfire of the two bereft women and tells them the tale of St. Peter. Our energies of response are different in quality, but they are equally intense.